Hi, welcome, and thank you all for coming. I'm Jesse Dottilio, Exhibition Coordinator at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. Uh, we're coming now to the end of an incredibly packed program schedule for West of Center, Art and the Counterculture Experiment in America, 1965 to 1977. And we've been so pleased by the way our community has responded to this exhibition. <coughs> Excuse me. I'd like to thank the Center for the Study of Women in Society, the Department of Women's and Gender Studies, and the ASUO Women's Center for making this event possible through their generous sponsorship. I'd also like to thank Kathy Denning, our dedicated Laurel Award intern who is instrumental in planning the West of Center programs schedule as well as Sharon Kaplan and all the museum staff who put these events together. In addition to our program tonight, uh, we encourage you to come back tomorrow and Friday to check out Experience and Experimentation, the ninth annual Art History Association Student Symposium, which features a keynote address by Elisa Author, co-curator of West of Center and moderator of the panel tonight. And now it is my privilege to introduce our panel's moderator, who will in turn introduce our panelists. Lots of introductions tonight. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Elisa Author is Associate Professor of Contemporary Art at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, and Adjunct Curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Denver. Her book, String, Felt, Thread, and the Hierarchy of Art and Craft, examines the innovative use of fiber in American art and the impact of its elevation on the conceptual boundaries distinguishing art from craft in the post-war era. Her latest publication, West of Center, Art and the Counterculture Experiment in America, 1965 to 1977, is co-edited with Adam Lerner and focuses on the diverse visual and performative expressions of the American counterculture. Her scholarly work has been supported by major research grants from the J. Paul Getty Foundation, the Smithsonian Institution, and the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum and Research Center, among others. In addition, she co-directs Feminism and Co. Art, Sex, Politics, a public program at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Denver. Designed to explore feminist issues in popular culture, social policy, and art through creative forms of pedagogy. Please join me in welcoming Elisa Author. Uh, thank you, Jesse. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I want to thank everyone who has joined us uh, this evening uh, for this event. It's a wonderful turnout for a very nice afternoon. I'm sure there's a lot of people who'd rather um, be outside enjoying the weather. So tonight I'm delighted to be moderating a discussion between Billy Miracle, Carol Newhouse, and Tammy Ray Carlin on the topic of feminist communities from women's land to the post-punk music scene to the contemporary art world. And I'm going to begin by introducing uh, Billy and Carol and talking with them about their history in this regard. And then I'm going to introduce Tammy Ray Carlin, bring her to the stage here, integrate her into the conversation. Um, after that, there's going to be plenty of time for conversation. I hope the conversation will continue with, with Q&A. And I know that there are many um, of you here in the audience who have lived on women's lands or have been involved in other intentional communities, and we really welcome your, uh, your, your contributions uh, to the con conversation. Now, uh, without further ado, let me just get to the introductions. Billy Miracle is an artist and educator at Rogue Community College in Grants Pass. At Rogue, she teaches in the discovery program called Moving On, which was established in the mid-1980s to help women build the confidence in educational and job skills necessary to enter the workforce. She received her MA in art education from Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec, with a thesis about feminist art activism. And she was also a founding member of the now well-known Powerhouse Gallery in Montreal, and she's a practicing mixed media artist. Carol Newhouse holds an MA in social work and has spent more than 25 years working as a psychotherapist and clinical supervisor. Um, she's currently working on a PhD at the California Institute of Integral Studies on Buddhism, Mindfulness, and Healing. She is the co-author of A Woman's Guide to Spiritual Renewal, and she is the guiding teacher of the lesbian Buddhist Sangha, a very unique community amongst Buddhists in Berkeley, uh, California. Now, <clears throat> Billy and Carol's commitment to feminist community building intertwined uh, in 1974, uh, the year they founded the Women's Share Collective in Southern Colorado with a number of compatriots. Um, in addition, they co-authored the book Country Lesbians, the story of the Women's Share Collective, 
and spent many hours teaching and practicing their art, from ceramics to photography at Women's Share, um, creating really one of the most vibrant and original intentional communities in the US organized around the reimagining of civilization outside of patriarchy. So let's um, begin the conversation. I'm gonna move back over this way. I have to turn this off first. I'm just gonna move my chair a little bit. It's not so awkward. <laughs> hey, over there. Hi. <clears throat> if you don't know them, Carol is um, on your right. Billy is on your left. I have slides that we'll use to move through the conversation. And I just want to start off with um, maybe a, uh, some general background, like what was uh, Women's Share? Obviously, it still exists. We have pictures of that as well, contemporary pictures. And I would like to just initially approach it historically, though, to give the audience a picture of what it was and how it came about. And I'm just gonna, you tell me what you wanna look at and I'll move through them if you wanna talk about anything particular. Uh, I'm gonna hold this. Uh, just let me know. The How would you like to start? The tree is still there? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> tell us, what was it? How did it come about? Well, we were one of... Oh yeah, talk into the microphone because they are recording this. We were one of many <clears throat> women's communities in Southern Oregon, Northern California. Still not working. It's better? Yeah, yeah you have to get better. pretty close. Okay. We're one of many lesbian women's communities in Southern Oregon and Northern California. And how we got started was kind of different from what I've heard from other communities. We, Carol and I were living in Montreal, Canada um, I had gone there during the Vietnam War as an objector, and we met there, did a lot of soul searching, working on our issues, um, getting out of, I was getting out of a relationship with a man, and we got to know each other, and we started working with other women. I was working on my master's thesis, and we were, we started working with other women to make art that was different, that was speaking to us, not to some art world. And that's kind of how we got together. Yeah, so when we had a conversation earlier today, one of the things that came really clear to me is that a lot of thinking and consciousness raising, some of you are familiar with that term, <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, went on for at least a couple of years before 1974, before we got there. So we came uh, with a bit of a vision. We came, at least Billy and I and Dion, our third person, came out of Montreal, the art world, the feminist world, coming out as lesbians, into wanting to create something different, a different world for ourselves as women and, and as new lesbians. And we didn't know what that was. That was the exciting part. <laughs> But there was a lot of preparation. We would go and have camps. We went to Nova Scotia. We went to BC. We went back and forth trying to find our way and find ourselves. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of background before you see that picture up mm -hmm. there. It sounds like a lot of it is a shared interest in art and, and the creation of a, a kind of alternative art world. Definitely. Um, we started a craft store, a women's craft store in Montreal because we felt like women's art was not visual, uh, seen, and we wanted to have it be seen and seen as art. So we started the craft store, and women from the local community would bring their pieces in, and we would sell them. We would have other volunteers that helped work on it, and other artists came in, too, and put their work in. And as we sat there and sold them, we talked, right? Right. So it's sort of like ad hoc consciousness raising and selling people's crafts and women's crafts. And you didn't tell them the name. The flaming Apron <laughs> was the name. <laughs> so the apron was like a craft made thing and it was on flames. You get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's, what's fascinating to me, just having written a, a book about the uh, feminist critique of the hierarchy, hierarchy of art and craft, you were very much involved with that. Not only just the title, there's the connection between domesticity and unpacking or, or uh, dismantling the domestic world, um, the elevation of craft as a form of fine art. Um, how did you 
come to, I mean, did you see yourself connected with, with other feminists in the art world who were also part of this critique? We saw ourselves connected. I don't know that they saw themselves connected with us, but we were definitely influenced by Judy Chicago in particular, I remember that. Um, there, I don't recall a lot of women doing specific women's art and craft in Montreal at that time as an art form. I don't recall that. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have to remember we were in Canada mm -hmm. and we were in Montreal and they had their own social political issues that were going on and so a lot of the decision to leave and go west, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. I think I can relate to through this exhibit. You know, we were part of that. Mm -hmm. We wanted to open, we wanted to change, we wanted to do something new and experiment in the west, mm -hmm. right? But we did go to BC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we looked there too. Mm -hmm. So, how successful was the um, the collective, the f the Flaming Apron? I mean, did you have quite a number of women who participated? Was it a struggle to get women to bring work in? It was, was it not a struggle. We had no struggle with that. We were young. We didn't want to do this for the rest of our lives, so we saw it as a short term um, objective. And. Yeah, so we were ready to move on. I can't even remember exactly how long we were there. I don't think it was more than a year and a half. No. Hmm. See, because a lot of this, and you'll hear as we talk more, it was always about what do we do next? What is this teaching us? What do we need to do now? It was always evolving. And leaving Montreal was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the decision to move west, obviously there were, uh, as the exhibition um, tries to thematize, there's a huge influx of people moving west with this idea that it is a place to start from scratch or a place where you can imagine a utopian um, world or lifestyle. Um, how did you come, were there like any kind of direct connections that led you to Southern Oregon? No, that's kind of <laughs> crazy. Too. How did that happen? I can say no for sure, because I wasn't thrilled with Southern Oregon. <laughs> But basically, I don't know how much we want to do, but the three of us met up. It's kind of a long story. And we were the three that wanted to go because mm -hmm. our collective, so to speak, was mm -hmm. much larger than that in Montreal. It was a conscious raising group. There was the art community, as Billy mentioned. But when it came down to going west and doing a women's lesbian vision something together for women, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it ended up three of us. Mm -hmm. And the person, Dion Wagner, who's now deceased, was the one who had the money. So we had some money, and that made a difference. Mm -hmm. And we went up and down the coast in a car looking for land. And we thought we would find some other land that was already going. We went to Albion, California. There was women's land there, and mm -hmm. we, we went there thinking, well, maybe we'll join up with them. And I don't know, maybe it's a youth thing. I'm not sure. But we thought, no, we want to make our own. We want to do it ourselves. We have, we have our own vision that we want to make happen. And I can understand that today with the women's land that exists today and having that, you know, having young women come there and think, well, maybe not this place. I want to make my own story. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to say anything about these particular photos? Who is, who's in the top here? The top one is Dion. Okay. She's the one who came with us. Um, off to, let's see, the one over there <laughs> with a hat is Nellie Cowfer. She lives in Portland now, mm -hmm. and um, she was very much of the original five. And then, of course, I'm under her. And Sue Devi is the one that Dion went off to find when she was looking for a girlfriend. <laughs> 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 and then, of course, the other one's Billy. Um, this, these are the people that did the book. And okay. this was the... Um, we'll get to the book, too. Yeah. This I, just I, happens I, to be a, a photograph that I took on my trip to Women's Share with Kathy Denning of the, what looks like a cornerstone, but there's, um, it's, uh, you can't see it up here, but there's a number of, of, of names besides your own. Where? That's this one here, but it doesn't really project well, so we don't have to think about that. Let me, um. Did I do that? What, this one? <coughs> Sorry. All right, let me move forward. Um, this is just a map. I also included this in the exhibition that gives you some understanding of the number of women's lands um, that are uh, concentrated in Southern Oregon, which is why they are part of the exhibit. I was looking for a, a high concentration of very interesting feminist intentional communities. Um, this is a, a pamphlet that I found in the archive um, that Linda Long, Linda's in the, um, the audience here that she's so carefully created over the years. Thank you, Linda, for putting all this together. Uh, and then uh, a list um, that probably circulated amongst a number of um, uh, feminist 
communities and collectives uh, in the area, just to give you some idea of the context. Did you want to say something, Billy? I was just counting which ones are still there. Mm. Can you tell us? By name or number? Just wondering. <laughs> yeah, either way. Uh, Flyway Home, still active. Rainbow's End, Who Farm, Cabbage Lane, I think. Uh, Owl Farm, Stepping Woods, Rootworks, Woman Share, and I don't know. Oh, Home Free. No? no? That's not. Oh, I was thinking that was. Either. Regardless, that's a pretty impressive that's list. Pretty nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what else we have here. These are photos that I took with Kathy. Uh, when was that, Kathy? Last summer or the summer before? Last summer. Yeah. So you see Billy with Rose, who was living um, at Women's Share at the time. I don't know if she's still there, but a number of um, houses and a couple more, a few other shots for people who haven't been there, just to give you a feel for, for what it looks like. Um, let's talk about the building of women's share how did you do it especially given like the development of skills um at the time your urban backgrounds uh you know it's a very gender division of labor at that moment how did you how did you come about uh learning how to do this well one of the one of our goals was to be able to take care of ourselves on the land and to be able to uh, build what we needed and not need anything from men. And so we had to learn. And some of the women had skills that could show us what they knew. But the original three did not. <laughs> <laughs> well, excuse me, Billy had skills, sorry. The original two. <laughs> but we really, you know, we weren't those people. And they came, though. They came, moved in next door to us, and taught us so, so much. So very much. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I'll say for myself, I, I'll just take responsibility. I was certainly one of them that didn't have those skills. But I learned. I learned something because I just knew we were going to do this. It wasn't a question, you know, about do I want to hammer nails or not? Oh, we need to hammer nails? Okay, how do you hammer nails? I mean, we were just building our home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it sounds like it really wasn't that hard. You were just open to learning from others, and there was a cooperative sort of ethic of sharing information. Um, and you could do it. It wasn't that hard, but on the personal level, it is very hard <laughs> to live communally. It's always a struggle making your relationships work. And I think sometimes the physical plane skills transcend that in a way so that you can do those skills even though you're not necessarily best of friends that day. Hmm. So I have a lot of questions about that, what it means to live collectively, how you did it back in the day. But before we even get there, could you just describe a little bit about how you understood the term radical um, in relation to feminism when Women's Share was founded? And you know, what did that look like in terms of everyday life um, uh, at Women's Share? How did like radicalism? Like, like radical feminism. Like what did that look like on a day-to-day -day basis um, at Women's Share? Well, um, we had a little bit of a discussion earlier about radical. Um, I can just talk for the two of us, or maybe three or four of us who started. I don't think we saw ourselves as radical in the sense of that we understand that today. Mm -hmm. um, we were different. We were strident. You know, mm -hmm. we were original. We were doing something different that was very important to us. But radical. Um, I think the words lesbian separatist, perhaps as some of these words were more, more we, we came to, right? Mm -hmm. And we didn't come, I didn't come driving in there thinking, I'm a lesbian separatist. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it evolved because we realized we needed space, we needed time to figure out who we were and mm -hmm. who we wanted to become, and we couldn't do that within the patriarchal context. Mm -hmm. We knew that, so we had to build houses, we had to garden, we had to do many things for ourselves, and then we wanted to share it, of course, and that turned out to be the workshop piece. So radical, maybe by the end we began to think we were radical, but I don't know. What would you say about that? The thing I noticed was that as we went along, we, we got connected with other women's land, and we felt our strength and our power grow. And so then we would be more political, perhaps, or we would go to events and participate more in political things. But when we first started, I don't think we saw ourselves as so it didn't feel like ideologically driven when you were first starting. You just wanted to create this place. 
patriarchy. Mm -hmm. That's the word. That mm -hmm. was the ideological. We didn't have a word opposite patriarchy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was going to be what we were going to do, whatever that was. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's what I would say if there was an ideology. But it wasn't framed yet because so much of what we were doing was coming out of the present moment. Mm -hmm. So we would have a discussion or we would do a building or, and we would just evolve and evolve together. Mm -hmm. Oh, and go ahead, Billy. And some of our pers interpersonal relationships led to radicalization, I think, especially around issues on money and power and class awareness that we didn't have growing up and even as young women and we got as we lived together and we couldn't figure out why it was hard to do something with a particular individual and it was because we didn't have the same background, the same ethical background or or our, our goals in life had not been formed by this in the same way. And so we would disagree and then we would realize we need to deal with this issue about class differences, social class differences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let's look at some of these. Uh, this I think is one of the more fascinating documents that I saw in the archives and that I included in the exhibition, the work diary. I could have spent all day reading this. It's so incredibly detailed, right? Like how many people worked on this issue or this problem um, and for how many hours. Um, was this part of the way you processed with each other um, how to live collectively, how to divide um, responsibilities, um, it felt like this, the, the level of detail suggests that this was obviously very intentional and was a useful, almost therapeutic um, kind of process. My guess is that it probably came out of us feeling like some people weren't doing enough. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my guess. Um, I don't remember doing that throughout the years. No. I don't remember other than this one yeah. thing, and it might have been that person, Tori Hudson, who wanted to do that for some reason, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems like it was a moment in time. <laughs> Something was going on, but we neither of us can remember exactly what. But it is a beautiful example of what we did go through mm -hmm. when, when there were struggles or whether misunderstandings or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, these, this is a couple other examples of the, the kind of labor, but then also the leisure um, that you know, you enjoyed um, in on Women's Land. This is Billy on the left-hand side in front of her kiln. Um, I don't know who this person is on the right. Beth Brown. Beth Beth Brown. Beth Brown. Okay. Um, the gardening that went on. And then, Billy, I, I included this because this is a shirt that you talk about, that you made. Um, you talk about it in your MA thesis in very beautiful ways, and then it reappears in... Um, uh, woman's spirit, and there's a poem that goes along with it, and I've always felt that it, it sort of represented um, like your philosophical and political goals um, for women's share, and I just wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. I was, I really believed that women's art was not seen, and that was the basis of my work in fiber arts, and had not been appreciated as an art form. And so that's where that shirt came from. And there's some other photographs too of um, fiber headdresses and <laughs> costumes. And, um, and I think that carried over into our work at Women's Share, wanting to include everybody and teach everybody what we knew and, and share that vision of creativity as being accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the other things I thought that it expressed when I was reading your description of it in the in your MA thesis was that um, your vision of feminist um, sort of utopian place was a combination or a conflation of work, leisure, and art into a total lifestyle, right? And so represented by the shirt, something that actually like disappears into everyday life. Um, but also you're experiencing it as uh, something that you've made, a handmade item, uh, a creative practice in some way. And Carol was also very closely involved with this because of her photography. She was very interested in, in portraying those images that hadn't been seen before. And so uh, she did a lot of really good photographs of the fiber work. I feel like um, I was asking myself that question today. Why was I taking so many pictures of um, women? In, I think these three examples are perfect, too. You know, doing their creative pr 
process or showing their creative selves or and in the way that they're doing it, especially Billy at the kill and nude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. And it, it, was, it was a search for deepening for understanding on my own part. You know, the seeing, the looking, and then the re-looking, and that takes place in those days in the dark room. Mm -hmm. You know, and that whole process of internalizing and externalizing and coming mm -hmm. to understanding through others, other women, so much like myself, who I am, in fact, mm -hmm. and who we are. And then we had, we had media to show these. I mean, part of the reason I'm not really doing photography anymore is because by the mid-'80s, a lot of the women's publications didn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, so people... There was no venue, really, unless you were a creative artist and were doing a big show or something. But, you know, for someone like me, there wasn't really an outlet. I mean, before they were in women's newspapers and women's magazines, mm -hmm. and, and people saw them all over the place, you mm -hmm. know. And people would recognize us from these things, and it, it was our communication tool and a, and a way for me to reflect on who, what a lesbian feminist separatist was. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some other shots here. Um, here's Billy and... Carol in the bathtub on the left-hand side. This looks like a communal gathering um, on the bottom. That's actually a shot that was published in Women's Share, and we'll get to Women's Share in a second. And then this, Carol, this is something that you sent me on the right-hand side, and I don't know anything about that photo. So that's the women, from what I remember, our lesbian art and photography workshop. So it was one of our workshops. And I would say, Billy, what would you say, 15 maybe women? something like that came, and they mainly came usually in those days from the cities, so from San Francisco or Portland, mm -hmm. and they would be artists or photographers, and this is an example of a photo shoot that we kind of did on, it looks to me like, um, which house was it? Hexagon. The Hexagon, as we were building it, and um, it was just spontaneous. We called it dress up. We didn't call it drag, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or gender bending or whatever, but, you know, if you look at it, you can see hints you know, that kind of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And um, that was one of my favorite events. I don't know if any of you know the um, lesbian photographer, Kathy Cade, but she was also there, and there's photographs of her. So it was one of those moments, you mm -hmm. know, where, where we came together. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the publication of Country Lesbian Lesbians. I know you're also involved in Women's Spirit. I think, Carol, this is a photograph that you took that's on the cover of one of the 1975 issues. And then just jumping forward a little bit, um, all these wonderful workshops that you uh, organize for Women's Share, which I think is a really remarkable part of um, the collective. Let's go back here. First, I just want to have a basic question about Country Lesbians, um, why you decided to write it, because it's an, it's an interesting hybrid combination of like memoir and then also how to uh, be part of a collective. Um, there's a section where you write letters to your parents, coming out letters. It's really fascinating read, and I just was hoping that you could give us a little bit about the, the background of that and, and um, your the motivations behind it. Well, once we all got together and we started working together and we gradually got politicized, then we thought, well, we can spread that out. We can pass that along. We can invite people in to share that experience and also teach what we know and learn what they have to teach us. So, um, and then we were, at that point, then we thought, well, we'll make a book. We can do that. Yeah, see, it was like, we can make it, we can do it, whatever. And I don't really, I mean, how we managed to pull that off, you know, it was cheaper in those days and it was much more possible to do those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is the ti was the title related to Country Women Magazine? Not directly in any way. I had photographs in there, but um, no. But you knew of country women? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask a question about the hard copy version, which I have a small inset photograph of? Um, where does that illustration on the cover come from? Because it has a, a slightly kind of um, Maoist feel to it. <laughs> um, and I'm just thinking... There's like original artwork for it in the archive, and I'm like, where did they get this, or who came up with that? What are you talking about? I'm talking about the, the inset one, yeah. That, it only appears on the hard copy version, and so that's what I wasn't sure if you had designed that or not. Or, or Yeah, I designed that, and, <laughs> and I was not a Maoist. <laughs> I might have become one later, but I wasn't <laughs> one then. And what was the other part of that? Were you looking at, at something particular when you put that together? Not that I recall. And I believe I was working from photographs. Hmm. 
Okay. Of those you women. Know, you know what occurs to me to say is it reflects how proud Billy was, how great she thought we were. I mean, you know, I know what you're talking about because I was in China in the, like the 70s and 80s, and I know what you're talking about. Giant pictures of faces mm -hmm. of people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to say, um, I wanted to do it also for the photographs because, and you know, we didn't have to put photographs in either or all the drawings that Billy did, but. I wanted to do that because I was so proud of who we were and who we were becoming, and I wanted the images in there because mm -hmm. to me the images, you know how they say, spoke mm -hmm. the words that we couldn't necessarily get across. Mm -hmm. The one, the picture on the top left was, was the original version of the book, and then we sold out all those copies, and so we did it again, and you know how artists are, they're never satisfied <laughs> with their work, and so I wanted to make it better, so that was the next version. Uh -huh. So I just thought of something that I, I meant to ask earlier, um, and Carol, you reminded me of it, like this idea or this feeling of pride in what you're creating. Um, would you, this wasn't an escapist um, project. I mean, I don't see it as some, like, yes, you wanted to leave, um, you know, the urban um, uh, setting, you wanted to live outside of patriarchy, et cetera, but I, I view it more as a utopian project in the sense that you truly believed that you were going to rebuild civilization from the ground up. Not that, listen, I'm just out of here because I'm sick of this and I don't want anything to do with like the world the way it is. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I think you said it beautifully yourself. I mean, that, that's basically what we thought. Um, we didn't talk about it a whole lot though, really. You know, we were so busy doing it, um, <laughs> you know, but um, I think we really felt that as women and lesbians, you know, we did, we thought we were sort of special, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, we could do this thing. And in a way we did. I mean, in a way, as Billy pointed out, I learned things and I became, to me, that that's the most formative experience of my entire life. And I've done a lot of things. I've traveled, I've taught different places and stuff, but... Um, there was something about that sharing and the trust and the depth that we reached together and the struggle, because as Billy pointed out, it was not easy. And we were willing to stay there. And to this day, you know, I can walk into a room, I trust this woman in my life. And, you know, we don't live together, you know, and <laughs> I don't live in Oregon. And, and it's something that comes from that kind of thing. And that's worth it. That's worth doing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how hard you worked, and I'm sure this is the same for many of the intentional communities throughout the, the U.S. in this period, many of which are dismissed by, um, you know, histories of the new left as, you know, people who are, are not doing anything, are basically retreating, right? But if you read things, you know, that's one of the things that I think is wonderful about country lesbians, like just the sheer amount of work that had to take place in order to sort of establish and maintain um, uh, the collective is is um, very impressive. Um, did you want to say anything about um, anything else about these publications? I mean, Women's Spirit for people who don't know was a very important uh, periodical that was produced out of Rootworks, but there were many people involved, including yourselves. So, there's people here that know about Women's Spirit magazine. I think um, we met Ruth and Jean Mountain Girl very early on, wasn't it right away? And um, they were coming from, of course, a different place. They were oh, much older than us. But the thing that I think of personally is the spirit element, Women's Spirit magazine, obviously. Mm -hmm. So right from the beginning, they were coming at it with a more spiritual, what do you want to call it, back to the earth, nature-based kind of philosophy take on what we were all doing together. Mm -hmm. And it spoke to some of us more than others, mm -hmm. that language. And over the years, there were two or three of us that really went more in that direction. But it was an artistic endeavor again. It was mm -hmm. a creative product, right? And so we were all joining together around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we worked on probably the first and second issues, maybe a little, not, not, not very long after it got started did we get out of the collective that was making that magazine. But we did, we did work on the creative part of that. Mm -hmm. um, these are illustrations from Country Lesbians. It ranges from uh, sort of cartoon-like descriptions of a worm farm to a how-to, how to put together your own shelf, and then beautiful drawing um, up top that, that shows the buildings um, at Women's Share. I love these illustrations. And it's combined, as you said, with a series of photographs that show the actual building of the site and the work and labor that was involved. So um, 
I have to say, Women Share did some really great things, but I don't know if we stood out in the area of horticulture <laughs> exactly. And, but um, we, you know, we had our organic garden and stuff, but we did. A, we just went a little bit in a different direction. Um, however, we did the worm farm, <laughs> and the idea there was Sue Devi decided that uh, some of you may know, you know, you get these worms and you put them in these bins and they multiply and you get organic compost and you get worms and whatever it was. And <laughs> one day, right, we go up to see how the worms are doing, and we pull the, the thing off, and they're all gone, every <laughs> single one of them. <laughs> you know, because we didn't know. You know, we, didn't, we were learning, and we didn't have the worm teacher. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it was, it, you know, so, so we had our little mini failures as well along sure, the line. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, this is also another fascinating aspect of Women Share, the number of workshops that you put together. Again, a huge amount of work. Um, this one, Women Creating Women, I love because it says a gathering of women. I can't read it without my glasses. Poets, writers, carpenters, musicians, um, woodworkers, photographers, and creators of new forms. Like probably the most open-ended description of an art world that I um, have seen from the period and, you know, since. I think that's fantastic. Um, there's the, the image on the, on the left-hand side has uh, country skills, class and race, um, oppression. This is a, a, a page that describes the, the details of the women, create women um, uh, workshops. It's divided into discussion groups, sharing, and actual work groups where you learn a skill. Um, and then this one is very impressive too, just based on the, first of all, the number, the sheer number of workshops that you put together and then the range of topics. Um, I just thought that you might want to talk about a little bit about like, where did all this expertise come from? Um, and who came to these, 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 uh, these workshops? Well, I want to talk about the older women workshop. We were probably 31. <laughs> And I remember thinking I was older. I was an older woman now. And so we wanted to have a workshop to talk about that and to learn about that and share. And, <laughs> and I remember a friend in the community went back to Berkeley and started working with this group called Slightly Older Lesbians. <laughs> so we had this definitely, these were issues that we wanted help with. We wanted to talk about. Okay. So they came from just your own needs, your own desires. And our idea that we had something to say about them. Because uh -huh. right? we were experimenting all the time with mm -hmm. it. Um, the lesbian sexuality one was particularly popular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know how many of you heard about some of these things, but I mean, there were things where people would get advice, you know, about how to masturbate and, you know, all this kind of stuff. People would talk about monogamy and non-monogamy and what a threesome was and, you know, and some people would go off in the woods and experiment with some of these things and mm -hmm. come back. I mean, really. And it was just, hey, you know, that's what it was about. It was about, you know, living the... The workshop. So was the collective, um, were you all polyamorous, or like in open relationships, or how did that work? <laughs> no, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or I, I sort of was trying not to be. But it, it <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was the times. I mean, we're part of the hippie right. in the thing. Right. You know, free love was there. And also, we were learning, you know, about our sexuality. We were younger. And so it was only natural, I think. However, I learned through many trials that I just wasn't, I wasn't so good at that. Couldn't mm -hmm. manage it all. It was too much drama, too too hard for me personally. Mm -hmm. But there were many women that didn't have that experience at all. Mm -hmm. The thing that I noticed the most was that we would move from one relationship into another relationship and try to keep them both going for a while, and it usually made a huge, huge mess. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> so this Thank was you. obviously one of the struggles of the collective. Yes, because in, in, in our hearts or in our minds, we thought we should be able to not be selfish, not be just focused on the typical, normal pattern of relationship. Mm -hmm. And maybe we thought it was patriarchal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, it, 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 like the failure, if you imagine it, I'm not sure it was, I wouldn't call it that, but basically the struggle was um, that you couldn't make the theory connect to the practice in the way you wanted it to. And did that also happen with, with money and with um, sort of relationships otherwise, you know, friendships, um, class divisions, et cetera? The struggle was there for all of those, but we had the commitment to work through the other, the class one in particular. People had that 
commitment through a lot of pain and, and um, oh, fights and talking and ac accusations and, you know, all of that. But we all had that mm -hmm. commitment to stick with it, where the sexual part of it, I don't think we had that same commitment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, did you want to say a little bit about the politics and spirituality? You touched on that a little bit, Carol, with, with Women's Spirit Magazine and um, a, a sort of nature-based or goddess-based um, ritual, spiritual practice. I don't know if you want to say anything else about that, but that is an interesting connection of politics with um, something that you right. might think of as more lifestyle-oriented. Uh, I can just, um, I'll just talk for myself because I think, although my view is that we were all touched by this, not everyone would speak about it in the same way. But just living, for instance, in a chicken coop where I lived, and a kind of broken down one too, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and experiencing nature in that intimate way, not only the building and the gardening and all that, but actually at night, the darkness, what it's like in the country when there is no light, and if it's cloudy, there's no starlight. Walking that land, understanding sort of on a visceral level you know, wh how interdependent we are, you know, with mm -hmm. our planet and, and, and our cycles of life and the whole thing, um, moved, helped me personally to deal with some of these struggles that Billy's talking about. The understanding that we all are one, we are all together ultimately, and we need to get over it, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that for all of us, whether that was translated into psychic awareness, you know, or meditation and a kind of a oneness with, with nature and all things that it turned out to be in my, my direction. Some people put feminine pronouns, you know, on God, goddess, worshiping. Um, it, it, to me, it was all the same thing, and I don't think that this would have happened in the city in the same way at all. Mm -hmm. That's just how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't consciously know that when I went there. You know, I knew, oh, I'm going to get spiritual in the country. Uh, mm -hmm. I never would have said that. So, like, the return to nature was not about, like, spirituality. No. Mm -hmm. It was just, we got to get out of here, and we got to get away from the patriarchy, and country sounds really nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um I think we've got a couple of other slides here. Oh, these are the uh, another set of seminars that took place at RootWorks that I know you all were involved in intimately as well. These are the ovulars, the photography workshops. Um, Carol, you sent me a number of these, uh, two of the photographs on the right-hand side and then on the left-hand side, um, there's a contact sheet. There's numerous contact sheets that document uh, these seminars or these ovulars, as I should call them, and uh, groups of women who came together to learn photography, to practice photography, to share their work. Um, and I would also assume to learn how to accept criticism and, and, and praise, right? We have some friends here who we'll talk about later, Aggie. <laughs> <laughs> she had her work criticized, she was telling me yesterday. <laughs> um, yeah, so the ones on this side, the top one actually is the photography art workshop at Woman Chair. The oh, bottom okay. one is just a photograph of a woman who was there that I took, and I honestly can't remember her name, if anyone can. And then, of course, this one of the group here, which is spectacular, I, I know, think. it's a fantastic and, and, you know, most of us are nude. Yeah. You know, so we're walking around in the hills with cameras, you know, big, you know, single-lens reflex cameras, you know, and with nothing on, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, they were very, very powerful and very moving times. And Ruth and Jean Mountain Grove really have to be congratulated for, for that. Absolutely. Uh, this is just a shot that I put in uh, related to the archive. It was such a pleasure to go through the archive and to look at what was there. Um, this is just a box with a, you open it and you see this group of women um, together in a circle. And the, in the exhibition, I include a number of images of women in circles. Um, that has a lot to do with the philosophy of the exhibition. I can talk about that later. But I was really struck by the repetition of these groups of women who are entwined physically. Um, and then I just threw this in um, because this is also something I found in the archive. And I'm not sure who created it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Linda might know. This could possibly be another researcher. Sometimes researchers will leave evidence that they've gone through an archive. And this person has put down every single closing in a letter um, related to women's share, and it's just, it's incredibly touching. You, uh, When I saw it, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, a tear is coming down, you know, like it's it's very um, moving, the, the level of support and the level of investment of, um, that women had in um, in women's share and its, its survival. Did you? You did? We can't quite hear her. Well, I was working 
Syracuse Special Collection is putting together the Women's Share Collection, and it struck me that just how fascinating it was, how many, uh, what is it called, salutation, mm -hmm. that, that people use, and so I just started writing them down. Yeah, it's fantastic. I love it. It's like an index of, of um, sentiment and, and uh, connection. So I think right now it would be best to transition to bring Tammy Ray into the... Oh, do you want to say I one more thing? Go ahead. closing thing. Okay. One thing that I noticed in a lot of those photographs is the image of the circle. And that, I think, is such a common image in all of our women's communities, that mm -hmm. circle gathering of women. We don't remember who those people are, but we know that feeling, what that, what that was like to be in that family of women, in that kind of a uh, powerful, powerful place. Mm -hmm. it, it was, uh, you know, in terms of symbols and iconography that jumped out at me looking at the archive and thinking about how to include the archive into the exhibition, um, the circle became the major um, organizing um, feature for me. It's really very prominent. So let's, um, I'd like to introduce Tammy Ray Carlin and integrate her into the conversation. Tammy, you wanna come up here? Tammy Ray Carlin is an artist who works in photography and video, and she received her MFA from the University of California at Irvine, is currently an associate professor the California College of the Arts in San Francisco, where she chairs the photography program. Um, her work has been screened and exhibited in galleries and museums internationally, including New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Berlin. Uh, in 2003, Tammy Ray created a series of photographs of women's lands, um, including women's share and root works. And I don't remember where I came across these photos, but I was immediately intrigued. And I thought, wow, this is someone I can completely identify with um, in terms of your interest in, in, in these, um, these historic sites. Since then, as, as she'll describe, uh, she's produced additional series of photographs that document uh, lesbian and feminist culture. I also just want to mention that in the 1990s, um, Tammy Ray produced a series of well-known fanzines, including I Heart, Amy Carter, and she collaborated on the record art for the bands Bikini Kill, The Fakes, and The Butchies, and these are well-known groups associated with, with the Riot Girl movement. From 1997 to 2005, she co-ran Mr. Lady Records and Videos. Um, that's an, that was an independent record label and video art distribution company that was dedicated to the production and distribution of queer and feminist culture. So like Carol and Billy, um, Tammy Ray has long been involved in the creation of lesbian feminist communities around art and culture, and that's partly why we have her here with us today. Uh, we planned for Tammy Ray to give uh, the audience an introduction to her work as an artist and a, and a bit about her history as a riot girl. So I'm gonna turn it over to her and she's gonna uh, walk you through her evolution as an artist with um, some images. Okay, thank you. Um, is it on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then forward is... You use this button. Oh, sorry. And there's one blank slide, so there you go. Let's just start here. So um, I went to college. <laughs> <laughs> And I read some books. Um, I, I was born in 1965, so in 1974, um, I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I, was, I was saying that it's an intergenerational conversation, but as I'm almost 50, it doesn't seem so far <laughs> apart from that table over there as it did when I first made these discoveries. Um, I went to, I grew up in the Northeast and I went to the Evergreen State College. I was the first person in my family to graduate from high school. I'm still the only person to go to college. Um, I grew up with a single mom who raised five kids all by herself. And this is important, I think. Um, I actually like to talk about that in museums and, art and academies. I think it's really important. Um, but I, I ended up um, dropping out of a couple colleges and ending up at Evergreen in the, the mid to late 80s. And, and as a college, it was only 10 years old. It just had its 40-year anniversary. Um, or I guess almost 20 years old? No, yeah, it was barely 20 years old. And I, I'm, I was very fortunate to go to a school that had a women's studies program and um, really strong kind of... Uh, political, social justice curriculum and community. 
Uh, and so in my very first semester there, I, I guess I was in my early 20s, I had, like I said, I had dropped in and out of college. I read these three books in a row um, in, in, uh, in like a four week period and it radically sort of changed my life as did a couple of people that I met in that same time period. Um, really different books, <laughs> uh, really different perspectives, uh, really different histories, all very important to me. And I could just talk about this, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to move on. Um, but I did want to say Daring to be Bad, the um, radical feminism in America from 1967 to, what is it, 1975? It's an eight-year period. This book by Alice Eccles. I, I also got to work with Alice Eccles um, in Irvine when I was in grad school. I got to take a class with her. She was teaching history there. And that book specifically, and I'll talk about that a little bit, that, that book circled for me for a long time. Um, oh, thank you. Um, and then I'm just going to talk a little bit about living in Olympia in, in the mid-80s to the early 90s. Um, so I, I the, you know, Evergreen, it's like no sports, no walls, no grades, no majors. <laughs> Apparently now they have like basketball or frisbee. When I was there, they had like ultimate frisbee. That was the sport. Um, so you got to make your own curriculum. And so I was a, you know, I took a lot of art classes. I was a photography person. I did video, and I did a lot of uh, what was called gender studies and women's studies. And um, I did a lot of. Uh, I also did, there's two other things I would mention. I I got. For college credit, I worked at Safe Place, which was a domestic violence and rape relief center in Olympia. And that was a really formative thing for me. I did a lot of um, legal aid work that was specific around um, childhood sexual abuse. And it was a very big kind of conversation in my early 20s in my social group of friends who were making a lot of work and talking about abuse issues specifically. And I had this personality that I did where I dressed up as a little girl these are photographs of mine on the right that are kind of hard to see, of me in my early 20s. I had a series of outfits that I would put on and I would go into certain situations and interact with a particular event as this kind of defiant little girl who was kind of tantrum-y and um, kind of would take over the situation. So it was a kind of performance art thing. Eventually one of these photographs was used for the cover of this record by this band Bikini Kill. Um, in this time period, too, in Olympia, I opened a gallery called Reco Muse with eight other women. We had all taken uh, our first photography class together and um, started meeting outside of Evergreen, like outside of the classes that we were taking and talking about our work. Uh, it was all male professors. So even in, I had this great women's studies faculty, the, the photography faculty were all men. And it was mostly women in the 80s getting really excited about photography and talking about representation and, and um, performativity and, and identity. So we started meeting and we, we started this gallery called Recomuse. And um, out of that gallery, we would have art shows. We curated art shows. Um, we pur it purposely was all women. It was run all by women. We used our financial aid checks to pay the bills. And then every you know, five or six weeks, we would put on rock shows. Um, and bands would play and that would pay our rent for a couple of months and then we would put on art shows that would make no money and then bands would play and that would pay our rent for three more months. Um, so instantly I was part of a culture of women, of young women who were, um, I, I was relating to a lot of the things you were saying where um, we just did it. Like it wasn't, it was, people have asked like, weren't you afraid of failing when I started a record label and went $60,000 into debt? And I was like, failing? No, I, I couldn't afford to fail. I'll, just, I'll figure it out. And you know, par part of that is youth, you know, um, where I just, we just did these things. We just thought we could, so we did them. Um, but out of this gallery, this gallery was uh, birthed a lot of things, uh, several record, labels came out of that. Um, so Kill Rock Stars, and then eventually the record label that I ran, which I'll talk about in a second, Mr. Lady Records, um, came out of that. <coughs> oh, thank you. I don't know why I keep doing that. Um, like Elisa uh, said, I also participated in fanzine culture. So at that particular time, this is like pre-internet email, Facebook, 
life, which wasn't that long ago, um, one of the ways that we connected and communicated in the underground punk scene, and I would say specifically in the underground girl punk scene, was through fanzines. And I did this fanzine called I Heart Amy Carter. So in 1974, um, when women share and uh, many of these land communities were coming, were being birthed, I, I was nine years old and had a crush on Amy Carter, <laughs> living on, a, on the dirt road in a two-bedroom house with my mom and siblings. Um, and I started this fanzine. I'll say a few things about it. Um, a lot of it was about class, and a lot of it was um, kind of about looking at mainstream, you don't see it in this particular example, but looking at mainstream media for evidence of, of lesbian visibility and finding it in like the National Enquirer, where it would be um, uh, something about Madonna kissed somebody, right? Like Madonna kissed Sarah Bernhardt, and that was like really big in 1988, right? That was huge, and there was pictures of it. Um, so I was looking at that material and kind of dissecting it and reinserting it into this fanzine that was a lot like a diary. Um, um, it had a lot of personal writing in it and um, a lot of graphics, a lot of like eight, late 80s style graphics. Um, I'm going to go through this. Um, I could say a lot about the fanzine culture. Um, I participated into, in it for a very, really long time. Um, I, I'll I just say that this, this is a book that's coming out in June on the feminist press, and it's, it's looking at the collection. I donated 315 um, queer core and feminist fanzines to the Fales Library last year, and the Fales Library is a special collections library that's part of NYU, and this woman, Lisa Darms, who I went to college with, recently started this uh, Riot Girl archive there. So I donated this, this collection, as did many people, um, including Johanna Fateman and Kathleen Hanner, who were both in the band La Tigra. And they, along with Lisa, edited this book, and it's coming out in June. And it has a lot of this material, and it has one of my complete fanzines in it. Um, and I would say a little bit about, I want to say just a little bit about Riot Girl, which I was involved in. So Riot Girl was a third wave feminist movement that kind of simultaneously, simultaneously got born on the East and West Coast. But it really did start um, in Olympia with the band Bikini Kill, um, which was my friend Kathleen Hanna, who um, I ran the gallery with and who I had been in a band also called Amy Carter um, with <laughs> at one point. <laughs> um, and I, so, I was a part of a, a real kind of beginning moment in Riot Girl, but I always think of myself and kind of position myself slightly on the outskirts of it. Um, at the time when Riot Girl was really taking off in Olympia and then later in Washington, D.C., and then in chapters all over the country, um, it was, it, it at first was girls who were young women who were a few years younger than me, and I, I, I was coming out at the time, so I was coming out as a lesbian, and I just didn't, I didn't quite find my place in Riot Girl. Like I, I mean, I think I, people, someone introduced me a few weeks ago as the the mother of Riot Girl, which, <laughs> <laughs> which is like I wasn't it, but I, like, you know, anyways, um, that's not actually true in any respect. I did participate. I did go to meetings that were um, that functioned a lot like consciousness raising meetings and. Th those formats were really used by Riot Girl. They were they were girl exclusive meetings, and I'm using the word girl on purpose because that was the language that that movement really used. And that was part of my um, kind of schism with it. That at that point I was 24 and coming out as a lesbian, and I was much more interested in women and women culture. And I had done my business in terms of exploring girlhood, and um, I really wanted to move away from girlhood. <laughs> um, so this is um, Kaya Wilson, who actually grew up in Jasper, which is just over there near Eugene here. Um, she was my partner for many years, for eight years, and we started this record label together called Mr. Lady Records and Videos. And we put out music and we also distributed video artists. Um, we started it in Indiana in my first teaching job, and then we moved it to North Carolina for my second teaching job. And then I moved it to San Francisco um, for my third teaching job. Uh, 
So it's hard to see, but she's holding this little um, clipboard and it says, lesbian music matters. And then it's an, our agenda, which is like, save turtles and <laughs> convince people that lesbians matter. Like, um, I can't remember what else it says. Um, but we, so we started this record label kind of in a response to um, kind of being in, involved in the independent music scene, kind of coming out of Riot Girl and feeling like there wasn't queer visibility. Like everybody, I was telling Elisa today, everybody was bisexual and vegan in Riot <laughs> Girl, <laughs> and they're all married and eating meat now. Um, <laughs> so we, it just wasn't, you know, there, there was just something not quite there, and, and, and we really wanted, a, you know, a, not just a queer visibility, but a lesbian visibility, and we wrote manifestos that really clearly talked about that. Um, if you, these are record covers, and so the, a few things I would say, so the top left one is completely, it's a graphic design that's completely modeled after um, Sisterhood is Powerful by Robin Morgan, like we're using that trope. Um, we did that a lot. We, we used original graphic material um, from second wave feminist movement and reinserted it into our, our work. And, and we did that with honor, and we did that with a complete desire to not let history die. We were really interested in generation gaps and the thing that Audre Lorde said, which is generation gaps are a product of capitalism, that it's capitalism that produces generation gaps where you feel like you need the new improved thing, but actually you don't. You can just keep using the thing you have and let it grow and evolve. And we were really interested in that dialogue. Kaya was working at Lady Slipper, which is a women's music distribution company in Durham when we moved there for my teaching job. And so we were talking to a lot of women who were you know, older than us, which was really important. Um, I love the slightly older <laughs> women. I love that. It's like, did you hear me crack up? It's on the tape. I'm like, wah, wah. That's really funny. Um, but so we were, it was that, that was really important to us. Uh, the other thing I would say, so on the far right is the, this band, La Tigra, who Kathleen Hanna, who was in Bikini Kill. It was another band she was in that was on our record la label for their first few releases, and that record was called Feminist Sweepstakes. So we used the word feminist in all of our material, um, which wasn't always easy. You know, um, it, uh, we definitely took a lot of... Um, hits in the press. So I also just de donated to the Fales Library, the Mr. Lady Archive, and it was amazing, kind of, the some of the, there's hate mail, but then there's just weird mail about mm -hmm. how we were pigeonholing ourselves. Like if we just would drop the word lesbian or drop the word feminist that, you know, I don't think it would have made a market difference at all. <laughs> Let's face it, but, um, and then I would just say, it's hard to see, but the bottom left hand, um, Butchie's uh, record cover is a cover that we did and we invited all of these young gay men and, and lesbian women to come and be in this photograph. And some people, some young people drove like from Florida to North Carolina to be in this photograph. Um, and then this is just a picture of a box of things I've piled up to send to the Fales Library. So the entire Mr. Lady archive recently got sent to the Fales Library as well. And we'll, you know, we can talk about more about archiving and my complete obsession with it, obviously. Um, and, that, and then I'm gonna just show you examples of a few different bodies of work that I've made, and it's really cursory. Like, I'm just touching on some, just barely touching on some things. This was from a series that I did when I lived in North Carolina. And part of living in North Carolina was, um, for us, for when Kai and I lived there, was we were really, um, we did a lot of outreach with the queer youth community there. And I did a lot of public speaking and um, we put on a lot of shows and kids would end up on our couch when their parents would kick them out of their house. And you know, it was a, it was a, it was a big part of our life there. And I started doing, um, going to these different queer youth conferences in the South as a keynote speaker and bringing my four by five camera and photographing these young people. And so ev everybody that I photographed had to be, the criteria were that they had to be queer identified and they had to be 21 or younger. Um, and it's proved itself to be this really amazing document um, from a particular time period. Um, so these are from, 
I guess 19, they're about 15 years old, 1997 perhaps. Um, that's just two different ones. And they're life size. They're black and white. They're printed life size so that when you see them in a, you experience them in a gallery sit setting or whatever, you're the referent, the person is the exact size of, as, as you. This is from a series called On Becoming Billy and Katie in which I performed my parents. <laughs> so um, I, I have like one photograph that exists of my parents together and I basically took that picture and kind of psychologically died, you know, I guess dissected it and I made a suite of photographs of me being my mom and a suite of photographs of me being my dad that really kind of looked at class and looked at representation and I, I, I guess I would say, I was sort of thinking when you two were talking and when, when you were, Carol, talking about photography too, taking, you know, starting to take photographs in the mid-80s and being educated in um, photography classes in a college in the mid-80s and there was this heightened critique of document, the document or documentary and the sort of potential exploitive nature of that. Um, and so I've always been somebody who's been a bit more conceptual in my practice. So even though photography is a great producer of documents and recordings of history, I've always been a kind of once removed kind of photographer. Um, so this is an image of me as my mom. And I'm looking at photo history and I'm looking at Dorothea Lang and I'm looking at August Sonder and I'm looking at these classic um, historicized, canon, you know, canonized photographers um, who photographed working class people and incorporating the, the aesthetics and the formal aspects of their photographs into these photographs. Um, this is a series from, I guess, the early 2000s called Lesbian Beds. And there's about 15 of these. And um, these are sh also shot with a large format camera in which I photographed the beds of lesbians. Um, I can tell you really funny questions I've gotten. I, I wouldn't get them in this audience, which is so great, but like, why did they have to be lesbian beds? Why'd you have to call them lesbian beds? Or what makes it a lesbian bed? Um, I mean, one thing I would say is that I use, like I use the poetry of omission. So I, I oftentimes in my photographs will leave out the primary subject. So the beds of lesbians have no lesbians. The women's land photographs have no women in them. I'm, I'm really into this kind of open narrative and, and actually creating a stage for people to then project a particular idea or experience onto. So um, these are really formal. And so, and I also, I also made them by creating a monopod that could kind of loom over the bed and get that aerial view, which is a non-human experience, ex unless, except in our dream state, you know. <laughs> but I was really interested in the bed as a canvas and as a site of relationship and identity. And so like this one, I always think of this one as the butch bachelor, you know, because she, she's, she's an activist too. Like her, the, you can't see the details in this lighting, but the hat says Black Workers for Justice and she's reading Women in Cuba and there's no pillowcase on the pillow because she's just too busy. Mm -hmm saving the world. Um, so they're portraits of individuals, but they're also n portraits of kind of identity positions and, and people that I have known and loved. Um, and lesbian types. Um, the vagina slit bed pillow was there. I didn't place anything. <laughs> pe people are always like, oh, you put that pillow there. It's I make really staged, preconceived work, and this was the one project where I only used natural light and I didn't touch anything. People were told not to make their bed and, and I would get to women's houses, couples and individuals, and I wouldn't touch anything and I would photograph, and it was really hard for me. <laughs> so when something like this happened, I was pretty excited. Um, this is many years later, I had had a baby. Um, I, and I'm just, I like segue into that. <laughs> not usually the product of a lesbian bed, but um, I, I, I had a child in 2007, and when I was pregnant, um, so many people said, oh, well, you're gonna make good work about motherhood, and it would make me really mad, and I would be really defensive, and I just, in my head, I'd be like, I'm not making work about motherhood. I'm so 
just that people would expect me to made me not want to do it, which is kind of a ridiculous reason not to do something. But then I had this kid, and I did it. I made work about motherhood, because that's what you do when you're hanging out being a cow. Um, I, you know, I just, the, the, the level of kind of isolation, and in my group of women, in my group of lesbian women, I was one of the first people to do it, even though I was 40 when I did it. Um, so I didn't have friends and community around me that were doing it, and it was really isolating and really difficult and um, really challenging. But I was really, I, I made these photographs, and people have said that they're really sardonic and kind of, you know, maybe mean-spirited. And I think they are sardonic. I, I, I don't think they're mean-spirited, but I was very interested in kind of looking at the problemat problematics of motherhood and... and um, finding the sense of humor in some of it. So, you know, you, you just see this onesie where it says, me, 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 right? Which is really what it's all about. And then this is the sink when she's like three months old where I'd, I'd actually, I'd really left this pie sh heart-shaped pan in the sink and it rusted our sink. And so it's called Rusty Love. So the titles are really the thing that, you know, people can look at the image, but then when you read the title, you know that there's a level of, kind of critique, critique or self-reflection, and it's not celebratory, and I, I mean it to be funny. I, I don't mean it to be like a, a, a simple, um, just, just sarcastic. Um, uh, again, I'm just showing you a few examples of different bodies of work. Um, this body of work is, um, um, it kind of looks like a departure, but it's really not. It's a lot like the lesbian beds where it's this kind of isolated, like I see the beds as kind of portraits, but I also see it as these kind of isolated objects, kind of not grounded in any environment. Um, I, I think you'll notice too, there's like a, there's different ways that I look at domesticity and home. Um, so the, the looking at my parents and photographing myself as my parents and photographing the lesbian beds and then looking at motherhood are examples of that. Um, so this is a series of of a body of work where I became really interested in kind of uh, analog, two things. One is analog culture and the uh, what's going to happen as somebody who's really interested in archives. So when I lived in New York, I worked at the Lesbian Her Story Archives as, a, as somebody who was documenting the archive with slides, because that's what you did back <laughs> then. <laughs> now the slides are obsolete and they don't matter anymore. But um, I, I've really been interested in ephemera and objects and kind of issues of memorial and how, particularly in marginalized communities, how important these things are because you don't, you don't have a mainstream history, you know, so these things become really important. Um, so I did a bunch of these photographs that are tableaus of different objects. Sometimes it's a singular object and sometimes it's a tableau like this. This one's called My Inheritance, and it's, it's literally every single object I took from my mom's apartment when she died. And that's all I took. Like, those were the things that mattered to me. Um, so in a way, it's a portrait of her, but it's also a kind of portrait of me. And it, it talks about inheritance and how it's not monetary and it's not always genetic and what have you. Um, it, you know, they're just different things like bingo cards and recipe cards, her glasses, an apron, a uh, last crossword puzzle book, a map of San Francisco. Even though she never came to visit me, I found this map of San Francisco and her things. Um, this one's called One Love Leads to Another, and I photographed, uh, I basically took every mixed tape. Everybody remembers mixed tapes, right? Um, so in my generation, and I think generations before me too, but particularly like, you know, in the 80s, the mixtape was the love note, right? It's how you communicated. Um, so you get a crush on somebody, and then you'd go home, and you'd spend two hours making this perfect, and had to just segue, and which song came after another, and then, you know, and if someone did, couldn't do good artwork, then I would be like, mm, that's not going to work. You know, the, the cover was really like, the song list mattered, but the cover for me was really important. So, and I saved all of these, you know? So these are, but they're not all from lovers. Some of them are from friends. Like, because you do that with friendships too. You would just be like becoming best friends or having a connection or, or sharing your art with somebody. 
So they're not all just lovers, but I basically photographed each individual object and then I tiled them so the end photograph is the size that every object is in real life. Same thing with the one from my mom's, um, um, all of the objects are life size, so they're really big prints. Um, and it's a, it, again, it's talking about history and archive, it, there's some real specific relationships get played out in there in a particular time period. And you can read all the song lists, like you can see all the detail in these. It's like perfectly, um, and these are all the love letters from one relationship, a long-term relationship, which you really just kind of wouldn't have now, right? Because it's all, I mean, I guess, I don't know. I mean, it, it all gets played out on, on email and Facebook and Twitter and, I, you know. It does it, you know. I, you know, I had a girlfriend that would tour all the time and would write me a letter every day. I mean, that's crazy, I know, but um, that's so. This is this huge box of love letters that I, again, I just don't think this kind of ephemera would exist. Um, and this one, um, Sisterhood Unbound. So this is my first copy that I ever bought when I was 19 years old of. Sisterhood is powerful, and it's literally held to, it's completely unbound, and it's held together by a rubber band, and in the print you can see this, the, the page that's sticking out is like a, um, there's a picture of a man, it's, it's like some, it's a man at a corporate office where a protest was happening, and he's going like this, <laughs> and he's just kind of like sticking out at the edge of the picture. Um, so... In 1991, I found this at a thrift store. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell is this? Um, and of course I bought it, because it was right up my alley, uh, more than I knew. And I brought it home and I read the whole thing and I was like, what? No one ever told me. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I did, I grew up in Maine and I worked in this restaurant in between going back and forth to Evergreen for college. And there was a group of women that would come in every Sunday to this cafe I worked at and they would wait for me to be their waitress because the other two people who waited tables were men. And they were from a land in Maine. They were from a lesbian separatist land in Maine. So I knew, like, you know, but I didn't know. Like, I didn't know anything. Um, so I bought this and I read it cover to cover and I was like, oh, my people. Uh, what? No one told me. Um, and I began a journey. It was a slow journey, but I began a journey of, like, just looking for material and trying to find connections and starting to explore the lesbian land community. I didn't have intentions necessarily of making art about it. It was really just one of my interests as a feminist. I was very interested in um, various movements of separatism and what can happen and not happen in those spaces. And uh, what else? And then, so country woman, I found um, the, an entire box of every issue of Country Women magazine. Um, again, in a thrift store. Uh, where did I find that? In North Carolina. In North Carolina. And, I've re and I have every issue I've researched. And so some woman in North Carolina had it and either passed away or moved or got displaced, you know, or just was like, get these out of here, I'm over that, <laughs> who knows. But I found it, and to me it was a treasure. And again, I just sat down and I read all of them in this one summer. Um, and then, um, pardon? I was in Durham. And that <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's, yeah. And there was a great feminist bookstore there, and there was um, uh, Lady Slipper. Um, so another thing I would say is in 1995, I went to the Michigan Women's Music Festival for the first time. And, um, uh, and that was a place where I also kind of learned a lot um, uh, about women's land culture and uh, just learned a lot, let's just put it that way. Um, and I was, I was really, I, I just remember the first time I drove on, onto the land in Michigan and I, I was with a band and we were in a van, so we were being special escorted from the airport. And I saw this woman with her daughter, and the girl was probably about 12, and the mother and daughter both were totally naked, just, you know, at a tree. They were, like, <laughs> doing something. And I just, I just remember tears coming down my face. I was so, I mean, I, I'm kind of welling up right now. I was so moved by that. And so, um, 
I don't even know. I just was so moved. I mean, first of all, I couldn't imagine being naked with my mom. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I just knew that I was entering someplace like a place I'd never been, and it proved to be a really special experience for me. And I was really intrigued with um, the order at Michigan, right? It was really, and I can talk about this when I show some pictures. I just was so blown away with like how organized everything was. Um, um, so um, the, ovular the ovular workshops at Rootworks. Um, so Blatant Image, this is the magazine that was produced from Rootworks from the ovulars, the uh, photography and writing summer workshops. I think there were three or four of them. I have a couple issues of this. This is another discovery of mine. I actually got these when I, one of them I, I found in a bookstore and, and the other two I got when I um, visited Rootworks. But um, I, I was really struck in the 90s when I got these and then the other two I got in the 2000s how in the early 80s there was this magazine for feminist photography and in the 2000s there's no magazine for feminist photography. So again that thing about generation gaps and about culture and how why is it that things get just really chopped off and end and seem unnecessary or outmoded or outdated when in actuality, they're equally as necessary now, if not more. Um, so that strikes me as a loss, you know, that there's this lack of continuity, um, basically. So that's the cover of one and then the back cover of another. So this is, these are dark, these are kind of dark. But so then this gets into the work that I started to do in 2003 and until, um, I actually stopped this project when I got pregnant and my intention was always to go back to it and I've yet to go back to it. I was telling Billy earlier, it's like the next couple of years, one of my one of my plans is to come back to this work and this is from a, a series of photographs I did called Outpost. So I, based on collecting all this ephemera and doing all this research and going to Michigan a few times and talking to women, and I went to a workshop at Michigan on women's land. Um, in which a couple women did a, a workshop and shared material, and I was able to get access to the um, She Wolf directory to Women's Land, which I don't know if that's still being produced or not. It is? Oh, cool, awesome. Um, so I was able to get that, and I was able to write uh, to, to women and um, get myself invited to come and make photographs. And my intention was always for these to be landscapes. People often ask, like, why didn't you photograph the women? And, Again, it's that omission thing, like I didn't photograph the lesbians in the lesbian beds either. Um, I, I was really interested in the land itself and if a land could signify identity and if people could mark it and alter it and, um, you know, hold it in a way in which it could be a lesbian land, like lesbian landscapes. And I, and I really wanted to, to do landscapes because they were and are such a male-dominated genre of photography. And I really was using a certain kind of perspective, a kind of, kind of distance um, document perspective. So this is the entrance to Women Share. And this, I just call this one Rainbow Post. So each photograph says, it has my own name. So this one's called Rainbow Posts, and then it has the name of the land. So, um, and then this one, I think it's a sleeping platform. I just assumed it was, this is at Women Share too. Um, and this was a sleeping platform. And so again, I'm kind of doing that kind of style of photographing where things are really object-like -like and kind of sculptural and slight, there's a slight distancing. Um, this is Covered Wagon, which is at Rootworks. And I just, I, I just also was in my, this is a little of me coming through, I was really drawn to the sense of humor, you know, like the, um, <laughs> just the, the toilet covers on the, <laughs> that there are these like kind of soft, fuzzy toilet covers on this outside, um, these outside toilets. And that it just did look like a covered wagon, you know, you just hitch up a couple horses. And um, This is also at Rootworks. And there was a, I was really struck by the stroller. There was a woman living there with a child at the time. Um, this is at Michigan at the Women's Music Festival, Gal's Diner, which is the diner that um, they, where they cook all the food for the staff, for the, for the women who work there. 
it's really hard to go to Michigan during festival when there's 5,000 women and take pictures for no people in them. But I was really determined. This is the, um, this is in Michigan. It's sort of hard to see, but there are these latex gloves. There's one right there. And then there's one in this, tra there's a dark trail going, dark trail going into the woods and there's another latex glove. And this was the entrance to the twilight zone, which is what I was saying about Michigan, how organized it was. I, I just, the control freak in me just loved it, right? So <laughs> there was like, partying, no drinking, partying, no drugs, no partying, no drugs, no drinking, you know, <laughs> over 40 single, over 60 coupled, you know, it just was like, wow, I love it. I just loved it. So, and then the twilight zone is the loud, you know, it's like party SM, it's like the, whew, everything goes zone. And so this was the night after a twilight zone party and they had used latex gloves to kind of find your way to the play area. Um, this is partners, this is also in Michigan, and there's just two different sets of lawn chairs. And Porta Janes. Oh, it's kind of dark, you can't see it. It's a, there's, somebody put up this big, huge, glittery disco curtain. This is at Hollow Moss, which is in Northern California. And um, you're not going to be able to see it on the slide, but I, it's called Goodwood Badwood. And then on the pile of Badwood is a great lesbian processing note <laughs> where it said, you know, I'm going to make it up because I can't read it from now. But it's one of those kind of things like the, the labor chart that Elisa was talking about where it says, Helen will pick up the good work on Thursday. <laughs> Beth will be back on Friday to get the Badwood. She will take 20% of it. And then <laughs> Ethel will be here three days later to pick, you know, it's just like, we all know what's going on, we're on the same page, it's all good, no drama. But just the, again, that, the, on the actual photograph, you can read the note, and I'm sure like, the lay person would look at it and be like, what are all these women doing with this wood? Um, this one's called Pirate Platform, and this one's, this is my last picture I think I have up here, but this is um, on, on this land called Fancy Land, which is in Northern California, which is one of the last places I photographed that a friend of mine, Sasha, actually started. And it's not, it's not a woman's land, it's a queer land. So um, it, I've, she's, she's been building this land up for, I guess, like the past nine years or so. And she had several kind of tree houses that were thematic, and this one's the pirate one. So I think that's the last slide. Yeah, okay, that's that. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna start with one crossover question to try and begin a more dynamic um, conversation and then we're gonna open it up to the audience and continue that. So my question to all three of you is, is related to your interest in the generation gap and, and how to conceptualize that. And uh, my question is what do you see in each other's generation, um, generational experience that the other didn't have? Yeah, but like going both ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or what might you share? That might be um, easier to start with. I, mean, I, I think I think there's always things that you don't have. Um, I feel a little bit. I'm trying to think of like what I would want to talk about. Um, I, I mean, I feel like there's a lot that's actually shared, and yeah. um, it's harder to talk about what maybe was lost. I, I think partly part of something that was lost is um, a kind of capacity to, to um, self-isolate in a way. And, and isolate, I mean, in the best way. Like, I think it would be, I think there are kind of newer lands happening, like my friend Sasha's land and what have you. But I think it's a different time period with different kinds of expectations. Um, politically, and particularly around gender. Did you want to add to that? What I noticed is about the art, about how you have this ability in your art to step back, to step outside of what's happening. And we didn't have mm -hmm. that or didn't choose that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it fascinates me. And yeah, no, I was really struck by things that both of you were saying, and I can't totally recall them right now. Yeah, yeah. But the... Um, I guess the necessity to, like, I think 
you, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, but my sense is there's this real need to document what was ha your lives and each other mm -hmm. and the moment mm -hmm. where I feel like I was sort of kind of almost robbed of that because the critique of representation was so big, mm -hmm. you know, like it was so intense that, you know, like I got the, in co I mean, I wasn't also on a separatist woman's land, so in college it was like if you photograph a woman, you're exploiting her. Right. Right. And, and I think I also, now I have stepped back more from the emotional art and stepped more into trying to represent my life and my world with images that are increasingly simplified but still, still um, hopefully representing that idea. Mm -hmm. And my, mine right now is about home, and it has been throughout my life. And now I can step back and do it as a very um, conceptual piece rather than emotional piece. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I appreciate that about you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Despite the what you think of as like a distancing of yourself from your subject matter, it still feels incredibly emotional, romantic, and um, I mean maybe you would I don't know if you would oh approve no, of I that think, word. Oh yeah, I think um, yeah. And sentimental. For me, these are not negative terms, although they're often used that way in the art world. Yeah, I mean people have said that like about sentimentality or nostalgia or something. I'm not. Yeah, I. I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> I mean, they're feminine, right? I mean, those are feminine. Thi I mean, the the use of the word sentiment and nostalgia is to say that something's feminine, right? Mm -hmm. In a way. I mean, that's the underbelly of that as a critique. Mm -hmm. Why did you all save this material? There's a lot of material that you've saved, and that you've saved, and it's gone to the archive. You've also deposited yeah. a lot of it in the archive. I, I mean, I think for me, like, part of like all these discoveries that aren't of my life. Like, so finding all of those country women and the blatant images and the woman's spirit and, and that lesbian land book, and I saved all that stuff. Every woman's land that I visited, I saved every little scrap of paper that I have. Uh, I mean, part of it was that it was so difficult in a way to find that information, you know, in the first place, you know? And, and for me, it was, that, um, it was that thing about marginality, you know, so that whose history gets written and recorded and saved and archived. It's not lesbians, usually it's not women. It's definitely not lesbians. Um, so, and also working at the Lesbian Her Story archive when I was younger really kind of taught me that, like how easily something can just get wiped out. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, yeah. And then it's that bell hooks thing that marginality is a site of resistance. Like I, I really believe there's important scholarship <laughs> to be made about this stuff. And why did you all save all the material from women's share? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that um, I'm thinking about the book, for instance. Every once in a while, I would call up and like, Billy, you still have some books? <laughs> you know, because I didn't know, do we have 15 books left? Do we have 10 books left? You know? And it was a sense of, I liked what you said about um, not having to recreate things over and over again and make it, make, you know, Sisterhood is Powerful will cover 15 million times sort of differently or something. and. Um, it really rang true to me that, and I'm finding it true now though, I don't know about what you're finding, but I'm finding that there's a place for some of this now, you know, and that I intuited that. It wasn't that I needed it personally or something, but I just knew that, and I didn't want it to be lost because I didn't want to have to be all recreated every single thing all over again. And something about the queer community today is beginning, I would say 20 year olds, maybe 30, 31, it's beginning to give me the impression that I've had people ask to see that book. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I didn't know that that would ever happen, but mm -hmm. intuitively I, mm -hmm. I thought, it has to, you know, it will. <laughs> well, thank you for saving it all. Yeah. Um, let's take some questions from the audience. I have to put my glasses on so I can see you. that we had, you know, that helped that struggle of 
you know, living communally. And then Linda comes along and goes, this is important. Like, well, really? Okay. But so it, you know, it, like you said, it, it wasn't a sense of, we've got to write this down to somebody in the 25 years wants this stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was it at all. So it started from a different place. Totally. Mm -hmm. They're for the art part. Yeah, the art I definitely saved art because I knew I wanted it to refer back to or just to have to keep a body of. Can I ask you a question about your approach to the archive? I, I often think of you as the artist archivist, but that's different from, say, a curator or a librarian. Like, how do you distinguish your creative practice, because they're all forms of creative practice on some level, um, from, say, the librarian or the curator? Well, I think, I mean, I think the librarian's job is to be very um, objective, right? To kind of house things and organize them and make them as user-friendly as possible so that people can interface with them and have access to them. And I think the artist's job is kind of the polar opposite of that, which is to totally interfere and interject and be subjective. So, and then the curator is the middle person, right? They're, it's a little of both. It's like, I think that curating is actually a creative practice, but I do think um, it walks a line between being objective and subjective, I, th I think. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Go ahead. Um, this is a question for Billy and Carol. Um, I was wondering, I mean, I sense that there's a lot of um, relationships from the past and the audience. But before, before the question, I was wondering how many people in the audience were uh, residents of, or participants in the women's things. Or in the present tense. <laughs> conversation about Moonshare today. <laughs> you mean in terms of its future? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you pass it on when you may not agree with what's coming? How do you let go of your ego or your, your version of how the world should be to open it up to a new version? That's our question right now, I think. Right now at Women's Share, there's one woman living there. We would love for more women to be there. And I think one of the, one of the risks of women's land is that you never know what, why, they, why women want to come there and live what their needs are, what their lives are like, what their um, world is internally even. And so oftentimes we have women that cannot live collectively or communally and it makes, you know, my, makes issues with each other and, and it's just a challenge. And, and I think that's always been and I think it will always be a challenge. But come on over, <laughs> okay? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. In terms of the historical land, I've noticed in Eugene as a city that Semitism is facing out. And even very strongly women only organizations are considering ways of not being so exclusive about that. There's movement in that direction. And I wonder if any of those living on land or, or still involved in that land can imagine, even imagine a, a, a man living on land. Any of them. That's a great question. Well, one of the things I see is that women on women's land are hiring men to do Some work. Are. Now that goes further than my question. <laughs> oh, so, not all, obviously, and not all women who live on this land, men are hired, are hiring men, but that is a huge, huge, huge. gigantic difference. Ooh. 
I seem to remember women share often having men do work there. I don't remember it being in the, I mean, when we didn't know how to do something, we had to hire the electrician to come in and we did. We didn't. So I don't, that to, to me isn't such a big shock as who lives there and who gets to visit there. That's been a big issue at times. Can my brother come? Can my father come to visit? And I think it's that thing of how do you let go of what you wanted to make room for what somebody else wants? That's, that's I, aging. I, I think that's a really, I'm, I'm really intrigued by that point because I'm, I just, when you guys, when you were talking, I was thinking about kind of, like in starting a record label or a gallery or doing fanzines, they were meant to be temporal. You know, I mean, you talked about that too. Certain things you've done were supposed to go into the ether, you know, and, and evolve. But land is different. Like there's something like about the women's land that's really different than a feminist lesbian record label, which is meant to kind of go by the wayside when download culture makes everything different, you know? Or fanzines get Definitely. become blogs, so, you know, and things become different. Yeah, but yeah, there's things that get produced that are supposed to be temporary and are supposed to speak to a particular conversation and moment. And then the land movement seems really different to me. So, yeah. all of our land is now um, in our incorporated documents said to be held in perpetuity. That's a really long time. <laughs> has often said that she, she looks at cultural evolution and she, she sees that sometimes generations are skipped so that, you know, the daughters rebel against the mothers, but maybe the granddaughters get so sort of interested in what the grandmothers were doing. And we may take a few, few generations, but there are some lands that have been fallow of woman participation, and then that begins to change, and some other women get interested. And I think some of us have just trusted that over time, there may be fallow years, there may be struggle years, but, but over time, a sense of there being refuge and sanctuary close to the earth for women is an enduring concept. Mm -hmm. I mean, we may be wrong, but for some women, over time, um, we've been trusting that that so the answer to my question is no. <laughs> <laughs> no about what? A man? A man. Well, not in the visions I see. Yes, and go ahead. There, it, it seems to me that the women on the land are aging. We are becoming older. Not old yet, but older. I'm old. My mother died in the hundreds, so I had a long way to go. She was old. Yeah. <laughs> um, but who's going to take care of us? I mean, I, I don't have the answer. But I think that was one of my, in starting to go to the lands and take these photographs and going to Michigan, I was really struck by that. It was something that I was very interested in. Um, it, at the time that I was doing it, it happened to be st the, the start of the 30-year anniversary for many different places. It just happened to be Women's Shares 30th and Rootworks and the, the festival and the Halamas and all these other places. And I was really struck by that, like really struck by the, um, yeah. And the only way it can work I would think would be to have multi-generational women's land, and we don't really have that right now. Mm -hmm. And why? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, only, uh, only uh, the only one I can come up with is what we did when we came. We want to make something of our own, mm -hmm. and maybe that's an American thing. Maybe that's a capitalist thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. We were also part of a time. There was back to the land. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's other
other intentional communities that um, I went to and did research for um, related to the exhibition, and, and they're all facing this exact same question. Um, how, especially, especially if they have complicated land or legal arrangements around surrounding land and how it's given to others, right? Or can it be? Um, so there's legal questions, but then there just is also um, a generational, um, it's not a divide, maybe it's a gap. Um, in some cases, the lands are, are remote, so it's very difficult for people to spend significant amount of time there, so that it becomes like default vacation or fellow or, or kind of like residency programs for artists, which is not a bad solution. Um, uh, but it's certainly being experienced across the board, you know, for people who started intentional communities and, and still um, own the land collectively. Yeah, and I think, what's the worst that could happen? No one lives there and the land gets to be the land and there's nothing wrong with that. 